All right. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome back to HNB Conversations uh, with Cosmo and Rivka. And it's Cosmo again with Rivka's dad, Dr. Raymond Gannon. And uh, we're going to continue in our ongoing conversation. And uh, so good morning, Dad. Good morning to you and good morning to everyone. And uh, we've been, you know, last week we were talking about, um, you know, it was about having the faith to believe for the salvation of our Jewish people, for the salvation of the lost, to know that we have the, the truth, that we have this treasure in tr- jars of clay, and, and to be able to walk, step out, not in faith in ourselves, right, but in faith in, in the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us despite our inadequacies. Um, but if we don't open our lips, if we don't open our mouths and lift our voices, nothing's going to happen. So this morning, I just wanted to um, kind of continue our conversation. We've talked about the beginnings uh, in the early, um, the Bible studies, the early congregation, but I'm going to fast forward a little bit, um, you know, because I think about the fact that by the time, you know, you, you started this in 1973, yeah? And by the time you went to Israel in 1988, Jan- January of 88 or 89? Jan- January of 89. January of 89, so 16 years later, um, the movement as a whole had exploded. I mean, by that time, there are, you have the UMJC, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. By that time, you have the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. You have these gatherings of where other Messianic congregations had found one another. Um, and yet, within all of that, you know, the, you've, with the beginning of, with the beginning of any movement, all these ironings out have to happen. You know, these, these, um, because you've, you're, 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 what we, what we have is, a, is multi-denominational. We're, you know, there's, there's, when we gather together, there are those that come from a variety of backgrounds. And so I just, um, would love to hear kind of the beginnings of when you guys began to find one another. And you began to com- connect with others and to work through some of the challenges and differences and so forth. Okay, when we started um, our ministry in Los Angeles, it was evangelistic, of course, with the home Bible studies and on campuses and things of that nature. When we had one a sufficient number of people to justify and recognize the need for a messianic congregation, there were no others. I mean, we, there was, to my, the best of my knowledge, there were no other Messianic synagogues in the whole of the United States. As it turns out, there were actually two that had started just about the same time. One was started by Martin Chernoff in Cincinnati, and another one started by uh, Manny Brotman in Gaithersburg, Maryland. But I didn't know anything about them, and when we started ours then in 1973, uh, then it became known to me that there were two others. Mm-hmm. And so there were the three of us. Uh, but those two fellows, both Manny Brotman and uh, Martin Chernoff, were very much in- independent-minded and didn't really want to have relation with other groups that... Uh, well, I, I should say that's not so much the case with Manny Brotman. He really wanted to have more relation with, with, with other people, mm-hmm. but, um, but um, Martin Chernoff was more independent. Mm. Uh, the thing that really helped us get started, we had Phil Goebel and I, of course, were working together in, in Los Angeles, and uh, he and I were pioneering the congregation together, and in the process of doing that, we're p- compiling... Uh, materials for discipling and so we had documents on uh, water immersion you know the mikvah we had uh, a whole shabbat service and we had uh, you know about tithing and you know, pastoral accountability and all these kinds of things in a collection of materials which we then phil Goebel took and and was ready to um, publish before it, it before it ever went to publication, though, we heard about a conference that was going to take place at the Woolman Auditorium at Columbia University in New York City, Manhattan, and Mike uh, Mike Evans was sponsoring what was Shekinah seventy four. So miraculously, although we were comp- we were as poor as synagogue mice, you know, <laughs> we 
we, we, we miraculously uh, got the money to the very penny that we needed for the two of us to go and fly and take our materials and so forth. So we, we, we ain't, uh, thought that we would print off all of our discipling materials, which were used for everyone in the congregation, and we would put them in binders, and we would take 48 binders to New York with us. And so at the conference, when it became our opportunity to share what was happening in Los Angeles, we shared. So this was a conference for Jewish believers or Jewish ministry? This was a conference uh, for, I mean, the, the, there was an awareness that God was working among Jewish people. Okay. And the Jewish people were coming to faith. And that was, you know, something wonderfully to be celebrated. And so th this conference was designed to kind of try to bring all these people who, if they're engaged in Jewish ministry or just Jewish believers, uh, to bring them together, to give them a sense of purpose, perhaps, a sense of camaraderie. Um, a realization uh, you're not alone. <laughs> a sense of belonging, sure. Yeah. So when it came our opportunity then to, to share what was happening in Los Angeles, we offered these binders because we said, well, whatever you might need to know to um, uh, pioneer a messianic synagogue, you'll find in the binder. Right. <laughs> you know? So, and, and of course, Phil Goebel later published all this material as that very thing, everything you need to grow a messianic synagogue. Right. But we, we offered that and people charged forward. I mean, it was a full auditorium, hundreds of people. Wow. And they charged forward to snatch up these binders which would give them the preliminary materials they needed to launch their own Messianic synagogue. And it, that really helped to kick things off in a big way. Wow. Because then people went back across the country, and now they had some, some uh, thing in their hand that they could use. And, of course, they were able to use their own creative talents and, and sense of calling. And it wasn't long. And there were really hundreds of Messianic congregations. I'm curious because I know you've you've been friends with Mike Evans for many years now. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, has he ever talked about like how did he how did he get the word out? How did he find everyone that he found? Like you know we didn't have the kinds of I mean have you ever talked about like when he when he decided to put on this conference? Um, where you know did he were there I just I'm that's those are the thoughts that that hit me like in the in these early founding days like there's yeah. a there's a moment there that something uh happened where he, he had a database of something or I don't I just don't I'm just curious if well, you know I, th I think in 1972 73 74 uh, Mike Evans was not regarded as a threat as he later was mm -hmm. to many of the leaders in the messianic movement because he was so talented, he was so creative, he was so able to make things happen. Right. It, there came a point where they were afraid of him, you know, that he was going to sweep over everything. Okay. And he, he did in some respects. Mm -hmm. But but in any event, um, I, and on those earlier years like that, the early 70s, he had relations with, with a great number of people like the Chernoffs and like the Jews for Jesus and like Manny Brotman and, right. and others. And, and, and the kind of conference he was bringing together was a non-threatening kind of event. I mm -hmm. mean, it was, it was like, give me your addresses, give me the names of the people you have contact with so we can invite them to this meeting. Right. And they would not have been reluctant to do that at that point. Right. Now, later on, they may have not have been so cooperative with Mike. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I always was cooperative with Mike, and right. he's still my my very good friend till today. Right. I mean, I I think what we could probably see somewhere along the lines when you go from their cooperation to a later on where there's a reluctance and a sort of territorialism. Yeah, it that, didn't take long for that to happen. Right. That those are the kinds of things that can end up proving to be uh, points of hindrance and division rather than cooperation and collaboration sure. for the for sure. the mission as a whole for the call as a whole um yeah. but that er those early days every everyone's in a place of it sound there's a there's a zeal right there's a zeal there's a there's a humility 
that would be demonstrated in, I need more material. I don't have enough. So that rushing toward uh, the, to get, to snatch up that binder is a, a demonstration of a sense of inadequacy and a dependence upon the Lord and upon whatever, you know, that, that those were some of the seeds of this early movement. Um, and then, and then you begin to have where do people, do congregations begin to connect based on their kind of similar philosophies and things like that? Well, there were, um, I mean, it didn't take very long before uh, people began to want to organize and, 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 and join ranks. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, Manny Brotman came to the uh, Messianic um, Jewish Alliance of America conference in Grantham, Pennsylvania, which was an annual event sponsored by the Chernoff family. They were the leaders of the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. At this point... That organization, the MJAA, was was strictly, as it is today still, strictly just an individual membership thing. It wasn't a congregational thing. Mm. So there was no congregational organization associated with the MJAA. So uh, Manny Brotman came, and I was in that meeting. Manny Brotman came to the conference in Grantham, uh, Pennsylvania, and talked about establishing a new organization, the the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, the UMJC. Got it. And there was a lot of enthusiasm in that room for coming together and having some coordinated means of interacting together. Uh, Martin Chernoff was in the room, uh, and he exploded with rage because it was something that uh, was beyond his control, frankly. Okay. <laughs> And he wasn't having it. Right. So, so there b- became a, a very quick division among those that really wanted to uh, labor together in the UMJC. They would be developing materials. They would be helping congregations to, to, to launch. And there would be a sense of camaradera- uh, uh, camaraderie. And then uh, Chernoff, uh, in, a, in a relatively short amount of time, Established it, established what is called, I think it's the uh, I- IAMCS. A-M- yes. Yeah. And uh, that now was the counterpart to the UMJC. So it was not the MJAA because that was for individuals. Got it. It was this other organizational, denominational uh, organization. The International case. Association for Messianic Congregations and Synagogues. Right. And now, so these two were in competition with one another. Uh, and uh, there was, uh, you know, there was some bad blood for some years. I think they've patched most all that up now. Yeah. I mean, the, the uh, Martin Chernoff's passed away some years ago, but still, uh, there is um, a certain con- a certain feeling that that they are the messianic remnant. You know? Uh huh. And and there's a certain standoffish against the union. Right. Uh, but um, but uh, still, the, the, the you know. The, the rapport is a whole lot better than it was. Right. Now, you you were always in both, right? Or you were part of... I Well, I was in both and in neither. Okay. Uh, because I would go to both of their meetings. Our congregation in Long Island by that time... Right. Oh, it was, it's a, an Assemblies of God congregation. My congregation, both in Los Angeles and in New York and elsewhere, the things that we launched... Were, were Assemblies of God congregations. And let me just add, that was never a problem for us. Right. You know, the, there, were, there were those who said, you'll never get Jewish people to attend an Assemblies of God congregation uh, if it's a Messianic synagogue mm-hmm. or no. And the reality is that our congregation in Los Angeles was about 85% Jewish. Nobody cared a rip about whether it was AG. And, and in New York, again, we, our congregation there was about 65% Jewish. And they didn't care at all if it was the Assemblies of God. Mm-hmm. And it's it's what you do at the local level right. I mean, it's that like, determines the, whether people feel comfortable or not. People get hung up on labels sometimes. And yeah. the question isn't, what's the name of your restaurant? The question is, what's the food you're serving? That's so it. So you, you can franchise something, but it depends on what you're... Yeah. On what you're actually serving. And if the as the Spirit of the Lord is moving and people are encountering uh, the power of God and the transformation that He brings and in an authentically... Jewish environment yes. that then that 
who cares about whatever else people want to fight about and disagree over? So the the UMJC, uh, which is soon was led by uh, Dan Jester mm-hmm. and 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 folks that uh, associated with him, uh, created this this organization, and it really began to service the needs of a lot of different uh, congregations who definitely felt the need for this kind of connection. Our congregation in New York by now. Uh, uh, Beth Emanuel Fellowship in Holbrook uh, joined the UMJC as an official member of, mm. of the UMJC. However, we also attended the MJAA meetings that were in uh, uh, Grantham, Grantham yeah. PA. So that wasn't the or, you know the the denominational thing, right? But it was the the individual conference that had been going on for years and continues until this day. And so I would often go and I would be a, even a, do some of the teachings in the, the sidebars and that, that sort of thing for the conferences. So we had good relations really with both. Okay. And then I, you know, another thing that comes to my mind, like one of the first experiences I had when you were my professor, um, and, and now you were also my father-in-law in 1999, was the first time I ever went to, um, with you, it was the day after Anastasia was born, actually, your first granddaughter, okay, that, first grandchild. That, that would have been March we, the 8th. March the 8th, we okay. went to the, up to St. Louis, we went to the Luzon Consultation on Jewish Evangelism, yes. right? So this was something that had developed along the way, um, maybe, you know, I mean, well, again, when you look at, at that point, it's 1999, right? So you're talking about, uh, you know, less than 30 years, 26 years, from the time that you started your first congregation. And in that amount of time, you know, I think about that. I think, I think it was, that, that was all, that was 25 years ago. Yeah. So in the, in the, the amount of time from then until now was the, from then until when, from when you had begun. And yet so much had developed. I mean, we're, I mean, we're jumping way ahead to that and I, and I'll, I'll want to back up and kind of follow this trajectory, but to see over in such a short period of time, how things had um, had grown to the point where this, you know, you had this uh, uh, LC, LCJE that had developed and maybe talk a little bit about kind of the, when, when you remember that beginning or the beginnings of that. Well, the Lausanne Consultation on World Evangelism mm-hmm. had started like in 1974. Okay. And when that came into existence, of course, there were different areas of interest among all the congregants who had come, or, or, or the congressional people that had come together, including Jews for Jesus and others. And so they insisted that there be a Jewish dimension of that. Mm-hmm. So that became the Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism, okay. the LCJE. And that began to meet right away, still meets. In fact, they they're, they're have a, a meeting coming up uh, next month, I believe it is. Okay, and then and the people, a lot of people write for different um, articles and research. Oh yeah, there are publications that that come out of that uh, reg- regular uh, periodical that comes out, and uh, there's other uh, uh, groups that also are now are publishing things that are that are useful and informative. Okay, so so but you, and we still have these pr- two primary. UMJC and MJE designations of of Messianic congregations in the United States. These are the primary ones, but I should add, there have come along a few uh, junior partners in this in this uh, scenario. Okay, where we we have people that that were absolutely against any kind of a charismatic or. Uh, you know, uh, spirit-filled expression, and they were just die, die in the wool dispensationalists. You know, and uh, really wanted to follow a very evangelical line, and so they fa- they fashioned their own groups, and they tend to be much smaller. Okay. Uh, but but and, and and there's a, another group as well that's very much probably even to the right of them that have established their own organizational bond. Uh, but again, these are much smaller groups. And would you? I mean, I when you look at, I realize you're, we're talking in broad strokes here, because anytime we talk about groups, we have to talk in bigger strokes. But when you look at the Messianic Jewish community, uh, would you say that? Would I mean, we see a lot of 
um, openness to the moving of the Holy Spirit uh, across congregational lines within Messianic congregations, wouldn't you say? I would say, well, um, it's fair to say that um, uh, the majority of Messianic Jews are spiritual people who speak in other tongues. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of them. Right. And so it was that was probably surprising to, you know, to some folks early on when they began to see the response, people telling you, you'll never get Jews to respond uh, to come to an Assemblies of God Messianic congregation. And it may have uh, surprised some folks. Yeah, it was it was surprising when uh, soon after the fruit began to be calculated, we soon discovered that um, of all of the ministries, Jewish ministries going on in the, in the United States, only 10% of them were being done by Pentecostal, spirit-filled, charismatic people. Only 10%. Mm. Yet, 80% of all the fruit of Jewish ministry was coming through the efforts of that 10%. Wow. So it, it really supported the, or, or it helped to recognize the value of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the, the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, and reliance upon the Spirit's leading for effective Jewish ministry. If we were just going to resort to the traditional ways of Jewish ministry and live in the little boxes people lived in for, for decades or centuries even, uh, we would have very little fruit. Right. I love, I mean, like, I love the, the, you know, part of one of the stories that you've told me through the years is just a snippet from early on where you were uh, ministering at a, a place where a lot of Jewish people lived in LA and and the 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 voice of one of the ladies saying when you were praying for people for healing like God listens to these people <laughs> like that whole maybe talk about that a little bit about this I within um, the modern Jewish world this this uh, I how completely foreign it is that God still talks to us and listens oh, yeah. to us and responds to us and how surprised they were to see yeah. the work of the Lord through uh, what he was doing through you two kids. You were kids. Well, let me, let me for the encouragement of our hearers, uh, let me kind of give you the backdop to that. Sure. Uh, Cassini and I had uh, left Bible College now and we've gone to Southern California and we were affiliated with a ministry uh, called the Christians in Action because... The man we wanted to work with, Abe Schneider, uh, who ran the Hebrew Messianic Center on Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles, was a board member there, and uh, they insisted that if we were going to work with him, we had to go to, through their program. They quickly threw us out because we were spirit-filled, and we weren't going to deny right. the importance of being spirit-filled. So we're driving around Los Angeles wondering where we're going to be, uh -huh. and we lived in we, we lived in a Greek person's backyard for a month <laughs> and then we met you know we went up to the headquarters of the assemblies of god in pasadena and got you know got some a affirmation a bit of a a affirmation but then we 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 moved out of the backyard we we moved into a uh, latin ghetto in los angeles after f about three weeks of getting exhausted from people dancing on sombreros all night we, we, we moved then to a Jewish neighborhood on Fairfax Avenue okay. in Los Angeles. And so here, here we are. We are, by now, I guess we are uh, both uh, 22 years old. And uh, we are right out of Bible College. Um, we really are trying to figure out what in the world we're supposed to do. We moved into a senior citizen's apartment complex. Now, how did 22-year-old <laughs> kids get into a Jewish senior citizens apartment complex i really don't know how that happened but there we were and did mom have something did <laughs> i can imagine her talking her way in empowered by the lord <laughs> she may have that may have been a big part of it but in any event uh there there we were now living among all these geriatrics and uh and you know they're the kind of people that got their t tvs blurring all night you know and yeah and and uh, but and they're hobbling around on their canes and walkers and so forth 
And, um, and we thought, what are we going to do to try to reach these people? So we tried to witness to a few different ones and that, that wasn't really going well. And, um, and then we decided to open our, our home for a, a Bible study where these people would all come in as, as many as wished would come into our Bible study and then let us teach the scripture. I'm 22 years old. Right. I'm a Gentile. Right. There's all these Jewish people coming in. And they're sitting there. We had to, I don't know where we found folding chairs, but we found them someplace. Okay. It was like the only furniture we had, you know? Yeah, and, and they, they were like, yeah, we'll come see what these kids have to say. Well, yeah, you know, it was an opportunity to have a social event, you know, so they came. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and as I would teach, they would, you know, repudiate and say, who well, is this guy, you know, is going to teach us anything, you know? He's a child, you know, all these kinds of things. And so it was not going well that way. Although they were interested in, in, in the teaching, mm-hmm. and were surprised probably that a 22-year-old knew some of these things that right. he's now sharing. But in, in any event, um, they weren't buying all of it, you know. Sure. Well, then we decided, and, 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 and a, half, a good half of them professed atheism or they were agnostics. Uh, the others who did believe in God were mad at him because of the Holocaust. So it was kind of a hostile environment for Jewish people there. But we we decided that, you know, um, we really need to go out with the understanding that God loves these people and he knows every one of them. He knows their middle name. He, he, He was there when they were born. He has great love and desires that they know him. He wants them to worship him in spirit and in truth. And as we share the good news with them, we're confident that the God who is not willing that any should perish is going to be moving on them by his spirit. And he is going to be affirming the word that we present with signs, wonders, and miracles. So here in our little Bible study, you know, 22-year-old kids, and uh, I, had a, I had a guitar that I tried to play, and that was a sorry thing, but, <laughs> but in any event, you know, we 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 were so ill-equipped, as it were, except for the calling of God, the faith that He had given us, and the confidence that God now was going to move by His Spirit and touch these people because He wanted them. Right. He really, really wanted them, and we were now His spokesmen, and so. Um, we asked the folks, um, you know, we pray for the sick. Does anybody need a touch in their body? We will ask the Lord to touch you and to heal you. I'm telling you, in that geriatric crowd, mm-hmm. that people were not reluctant. You know, believing, in, professing faith in God or not made no difference. Right. They wanted prayer. And so we would lay hands on them, and God would heal them one after another, uh, demonstrating demonstrating his power and his love and affirming the word that we were presenting. Mm -hmm. We were moving in faith. God was certainly doing his part, and these people were coming to faith. And so to come to your particular lady, I remember that she stepped out of the the apartment into the courtyard and uh, of, of this apartment complex, and she called up to a lady who lived upstairs who had not come to the Bible study. And she called up to her, Mabel, Mabel. And uh, Mabel came out to the patio or, or, or the deck. Yeah. And she, and she said, what is it? What is it? She said, Mabel. And she pointed at me and she said, God listens to him. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is, it was an important realization right. for them. Because then they had confidence that what we were presenting was, in fact, divinely sanctioned truth. Right. And when we talk about uh, healing and miracles, and you see that um, the these healings and the things the Lord does, He does, yes, out of the beauty of His compassion yes. and the kindness of who He is. Yes. Um, and but the the driving motivation is is to to heal the body so that will open up to the reality of the real healing that we need. That's right. And and what you see here is what well, I mean, I just I love I love these 
these stories that are of these true stories of of a youthful um what w- could be looked at as naive but just a trust in the lord that said we we believe in what his word says and we're going to walk in that and we're willing to like just the resilience you know i, I like cuz i i could imagine that you know we've all experienced on some level this feeling of disappointment so where you get knocked down where you move to LA you go there um and excited about working with a ministry and when you get there they're like but you can't minister in the power of the holy spirit you can't minister this way you're done you're out that that i can imagine in that day in the days following that that could have felt like a potentially crushing disappointment and yet to not let that crush you and keep you down or when they weren't responding when the people when you move when people aren't responding um you, it's not as though you just said well we tried mm-hmm. but you continued to trust that the lord was going to work and to continue to to persevere and um and the lord was faithful to that perseverance um and to you you know if you seek me and you seek me with all your heart you'll find me and what i see what i hear is this wholehearted faith-filled obedience of two 22 year old kids who the lord moved through powerfully not because of um uh, you know your undergraduate education um but because of your humility your passion, your dependence upon him. And he responded and, and the power of the Holy Spirit moved and, and then Mabel's getting called down because of the, because God is at work in, in ways that are, you can see. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. See, it's very important when, when people are hostile or angry or or calling you names or or belittling you it's is very important to remember how much god loves this person right how much god wants this person you got to over- overlook the raised voices or the or the you know the spittle that's flying or or the name calling you, you you've got to recognize god loves this person and wants to reach them and you've got you've got to be faithful not to be intimidated Right. See, that's what the enemy would like. Oh, you know, you get all this Jewish person all excited, and they're, you know, they're angry, and they're they're calling you names, they're calling the Bible names, they're calling God names. You know, they're not mad at them. God loves them. God wants them. Persist. Right. Go after them. Keep presenting the good news to them, and the Lord will back up your your uh, witness. Yeah. With signs, wonders, and miracles. And and I just and I think um, it's important for. I think everyone that's listening it, to to recognize that there are people in your life that um, are going to be resistant, and they may have a life full of disappointment and anger and bitterness um, for any number of reasons, and they've stopped trusting and stopped believing, and that that can be um, intimidating. And the enemy wants to 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 shut you down or to tell you how you. What do you have to offer? And, and you have to ask, what do I have to offer? And if you've stopped believing that what you have to offer is the trans... In, in what you have to offer, I think the first thing that we have to do is say, Lord, restore my faith. Renew my faith. Help me to remember. To take me back to when I first believed and when I trusted you and when you transformed me. And then let that transformation begin to flow through me and the trust that you can work in spite of me. And I think we have to step out and not waiting for ourselves to feel adequate. Um, But just, you know, you step out in faith and trust the Lord to provide the increase, that he'll do it. Um, And so I I just want to encourage everyone, first of all, to to do that, to to step out and to begin to um, look for opportunities um, to share the gospel with the people that are uh, in your life that need the Lord so desperately. Amen. And um, and to kind of tie 
both things together as we kind of come to closer to a close here, I think, um, is to continue to, to walk together in unity, even when you don't have, when there are moments where, you know, we, we see who, who knows what could be accomplished when we've seen kind of the divisions through the years, but what can be accomplished when we come together in unity, um, for the purposes of the Lord to accomplish his purposes and not get caught up in, in our own little hangups, you know, um, but to say, uh, you know, use me, Lord. I want to keep my keep my focus on the big picture. Uh, Mabel needs you. <laughs> you know, these uh, the lost need you. So, all right. Well, hey everybody. I, thanks again, Dad, for uh, for coming in today. My pleasure. Sharing these uh, these great uh, memories and these great inspirational reminders to us of what God can do when we'll step out in faith and trust. Amen. All right. Well, everybody, love you guys. Uh, Shalom, shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom. Have a beautiful day.